Thank you very much, Christine. And thanks to, to Tuan and everybody for inviting me. This has been a, just a fantastic conference so far. Um, so I'll be talking about improving the reliability of primate optogenetics. Now this work um, was not really done by me. I uh, oversee it and I uh, cheer them on, but the main players here were uh, my postdoc, uh, Dr. Martin Bolin, my PhD student, Hala Elnahal, and uh, my research tech, uh, Tierney Da, who's now going to be joining neurobiology as a PhD student in the fall. So we've seen a lot of excitement in this conference, um, and there's a lot of excitement in the field about optogenetics. And Ed Boyden um, introduced that yesterday and basically summar summarily dismissed it as a mature field that didn't really need to be talked about much in terms of the tools and everything. Um, and we've seen a little bit about that uh, just in this session with um, uh, Lindsay's talk. Now it is a mature field and it's been revolutionary uh, for neuroscience, um, at least in small animals. So just to give a flavor of, of optogenetics um, for those who are just tuning in, uh, this is a, a figure from the original paper by Ed Boyden and Carl Dyseroth in 2005. These are cultured rat hippocampal neurons um, that are expressing an opsin called uh, chondroidopsin 2. Um, and when you pulse light at these uh, cultured neurons, um, for short durations, you get depolarizations, and lo longer durations or higher power, you'll get um, the neurons uh, making action potentials very reliably. It's an extremely reliable, beautiful method. And 10 years later and beyond, um, this has developed into an approach for so-called circuit busting or circuit inter interrogation in uh, rodents, in finches, as Rich Mooney talked about, in uh, flies and uh, zebrafish and many small animals. So for example, in this paper by Carl Svoboda at Genelia, um, they injected um, opsins in a motor cortical area and they could anadromically drive the neurons that are projecting either um, to the pons uh, in the cortical um, spinal uh, pathways using light at the fibers. And similarly, in this, with the same recordings, you could identify neurons projecting to the other contralateral motor area. So it's really beautiful. Um, more recently, uh, advances have taken place um, in the design of viral vectors that allow for even greater cell and circuit specificity with less work. Um, so for example, you can label specific projection neurons using a, a vector called RAAV2 retro. And there are other retrograde vectors as well. If you inject this in an area like the uh, basal ponte nuclei of a rat, it will uh, be transported in the axons of neurons and label um, and let you control specific projection neurons of distant areas uh, such as up here in motor cortex. And now you can record from an area like motor cortex and not even have to do these anadromic exper experiments, you know that all the neurons you find are projecting to this region of interest. So super exciting. Now the problem is um, while optogenetics in rodents has exploded um, in the past 16 years or so, as shown by the orange data here, the same is not true for non-human primates as shown in the blue data here. Um, it's still pretty stable, there's slight increases and uh, those of us working on primates have gotten together recently to publish a consensus paper in Neuron, about a hundred author paper, where we basically are pooling all of our data into an open resource, resource for understanding what's going on with primate optogenetics. And my laboratory contributed to this as well. If we blow up this um, blue curve, uh, the non-human primate optogenetic work is still maybe a dozen or so a year. It's slowly increasing. But there are some serious problems and a lot of data goes, about probably half the data we collected in this open resource is unpublished. Um, and of those that are published, uh, uh, maybe half or so get physiological responses to um, transduction of op opsins, uh, even less get um, behavioral responses. Now we think that the main bottleneck here is in the delivery and expression of these op opsin genes into the primate central nervous system. And in primates, you don't have the luxury of transgenic animals. You have to use viruses to get in all of these genetic constructs into the brain. And the bottleneck is basically the viruses, we think. Viral vector efficacy is unreliable 
uh, between labs in, in the primate realm. And even within labs, you'll inject uh, vectors to express channel rhapsin. Um, in one monkey, it'll work. In another monkey, it won't work. And it's a big mystery, basically, why this unreliable, right, unreliability is present. A lot of negative results go unreported because they just don't get expression or they don't see physiological results. Um, the retrograde viruses that I mentioned in the previous slide, like RAV2 retro, are mostly untested in primates. And um, those that are tested are just basically putting it in the brain, hoping that they get retrograde um, projection neurons, but there's very little follow-up with histology. And I think that the main lesson we learned from pooling together all of these uh, non-human primate data that monkeys are not just big rodents. You can't just necessarily take off the shelf vectors and use them in monkeys and expect to get such a phenomenal result as you would in a mouse or a rat. So we have to understand why that is the case. Well, the first thing um, to improve the situation in non-human primates is to enhance vector efficacy. So first of all, we need larger spread. The monkey brain is about 200 times bigger than a mouse brain or a rat brain. This shows an injection we did in a rat brain in uh, the rat equivalent to an area called frontal eye field. It's a five microliter injection, worked beautifully, um, filled up basically all of the um, neurons that we wanted in rat FEF, um, and we get a spread of about this big in the rat brain. Uh, it, doing this in a monkey brain, this is to scale with this rat brain here, um, you would only cover a little bit of the monkey um, frontal eye field, um, as shown in the red here, to cover in a, a kind of a, a proportional size or volume of the monkey frontal eye field, you'd need many more injections, or you would need um, much better um, efficacy and transduction and spread. The, it's counterproductive to, do, to make a lot of injections because then um, you get <laughs> immune responses and the um, immune system starts to try to kill off the vectors in the expressed opsins. There's a lot of immune reactivity in non-human primates. It's a very sophisticated immune system, both in its innate and adaptive components. And this is just one example of a paper that studied that by Greg Horowitz. So first of all, we need to enhance vector efficacy overall. Second, um, if we want to really get at circuit specificity and look at, for example, projection neurons in one area that are sending signals to another area, we need to map these retrograde um, vector projectomes. Um, it's not necessarily the case that a, a vector like RAV2 retro um, is going to simply uh, label and let you control all of the projection neurons throughout the brain that um, target the area that you're injecting. So overall, um, our situation is like this. So we may inject a vector into this, an area like uh, shown here, like the circled bold area. We get, uh, okay transduction and um, expression, but not necessarily optimal. And if it's a retrograde vector, uh, it may label projection neurons in other brain areas, or it may not, we don't know for sure. A lot of this is unknown. And even if it does um, label those projection neurons, we don't know, uh, you know if the ops and expression is sufficient to get a physiological or behavioral response. <clears throat> so, in terms of mapping the reject, uh, retrograde vector projectomes, we need to know when you inject in a certain brain area, which projection neurons in other brain areas are labeled, but which are missed by this particular ve vector. And does this vary across the retrograde vectors? For example, RAV2 retro is one uh, example. There are newer ones coming on the market like NURET, which is a, a lentivirus. And finally, we need to validate the functionality of uh, the whole process. So if you get transduction and expression of opsins in an area, and if you get retrograde transduction um, to be able to identify uh, projection neurons in other areas, is there enough opsin expressed to actually make this work for experiments? Can we drive these neurons? Can we control them? Uh, can we maybe even affect behavior? So we need to validate the functionality as well. So that's the motto of my lab um, in, in team virus in my lab enhance, map, and validate. We want to go from a situation uh, which is the current state of the field like this, where we have partial uh, transduction, we have unknown projections and unknown uh, uh, 
uh, functionality and move to a um, state of the field like this, where we get optimal transduction and expression in the injected area, which lets us to really um, definitively uh, demonstrate whether or not uh, you're getting retrograde transduction to distance, distant areas in some um, situations and for other brain areas um, not. And finally, to show that these uh, connections can be controlled optogenetically. Now, the reason I got into this, uh, my specific interest is in the rhesus macaque brain and understanding um, visual motor circuits and how different brain areas talk to each other uh, to control the perception of vision and moving the eyes and moving the body in visually guided movements. Um, this is a lateral view of a rhesus monkey brain, and one of my main areas of interest is called the frontal eye field. Um, I've spent a lot of time recording in this area. Um, and it's not sufficient just to see what the signals are in an area like this um, to really connect it with the rest of the brain. We need to know it's the signals that this area is receiving and the signals that it's sending out to specific other areas. So we need to know um, both the connections and the signals. Um, one circuit that I've spent a lot of time um, <clears throat> figuring out is the connections between frontal eye field and superior colliculus. The frontal eye field sends projections directly to the superior colliculus in the brainstem, and the colliculus reciprocates through a disynaptic pathway that goes through the thalamus, particularly the mediodorsal um, nucleus of the thalamus. In the long term, um, it, from this work that we're doing with viruses and um, optogenetics, we want to transition from electrophysiological study of this network because all of this work was done using anadromic activation, orthodromic activation, et cetera, and turn over into a, a optogenetic um, study design. So first of all, our efforts to enhance efficacy have included suppressing immune responses. Um, there are innate immune responses. Uh, for example, there are enzymes called topo topoisomerases that will inhibit um, AAV from uh, going from this, its single-stranded genome into uh, second-strand synthesis and prevent AAV um, the genome from being expressed. So we want to inhibit those topo isomerases. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is one uh, example of a study we did where we inhibited them. This is the rhesus monkey brain. I'm going to show you a cross section. So this is called a coronal section through the brain. And this is the frontal eye field after injecting RAV2 retro and waiting for a survival duration. And you get local expression near the injection site, which is fine. When we did this in conjunction with IV doxorubicin, which is a topoisomerase inhibitor, the same, um, uh, basically the same size of injection allowed AAV uh, transduction of this fluorophore, which was our indicator throughout the entire frontal eye field. So it's a, really a wonderful enhancement so far using this approach. Um, we also want to suppress adaptive immune responses, such as those from T cells. So we're using T cell inhibitors. And finally, we can, um, design AAV capsids to increase the spread specifically for monkeys. And this is a collaboration with uh, Jude Samulski and Tom McGowan at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. But I don't have time to show the data for the, those latter two methods. Now, um, if we can get enhanced uh, transduction and expression of the opsins, then we have the opportunity to really map the projectome of retrograde viruses in the primate brain. Um, to do this, we use uh, histology and anatomy after injections with RAV2 retro. Um, and some of this is published. Uh, this is a collaboration um, with Sarah Heilbrunner at uh, University of Minnesota. So that's one way to really uh, map things out is to inject and to look and see exactly which projection neurons um, were labeled after your, uh, the injection. Second, we found that there are um, interactions uh, between the promoters in your genetic constructs and the capsids that you use for delivery, the AV capsids. Um, so one other thing we're doing is examining these interactions and trying to find the best promoters um, for individual viral vectors that we use. And some of this is published as well in the collaboration with Jude Samulski. So first, an example of data we have um, from the histology and anatomy, looking at the mapping of the projections. Uh, in this, this is a case uh, of one monkey. We injected um, RAV2 retro into the frontal eye field using the keg promoter. And we do see uh, labeled uh, projection neurons in many different brain areas. So for example, uh, in the contralateral, this is in the frontal eye field, 
contralateral frontal eye field um, labeled really well. So the neurons in the contralateral eye field that are projecting over to the injection site um, are expressing the GFP. Some other brain areas like the claustrum down here also were uh, really uh, labeled nicely uh, and a little bit in areas like the supplementary eye field. Kind of uh, disappointingly though, um, for what I really wanna get at, which is studying the circuit, one of the main uh, projection neurons I want to study is, are the ones in the thalamus that project up to frontal eye field. And using this um, vector, we were never able to get retrograde um, labeling in those neurons. So there's a lot of selectivity here in the ability to uh, retrogradely label uh, sites. And there's also this capsid promoter interaction. Um, when we do the same experiment, basically, but using HSIN instead of KEG as the promoter, um, we get different results. So this is one example. Um, we still get a, a projection neuron labeling in the supplementary eye field, get nothing in the contralateral uh, frontal eye field, and nothing in the claustrum. So putting together a lot of uh, data like this from many monkeys and many uh, capsid and um, promoter uh, uh, injections, we've started to develop a projection map of RAV2 retro in the primate brain. Just to summarize that um, when injecting into frontal eye field, you can get good um, projection neuron labeling in the contralateral frontal eye field in other areas like DLPFC and LIP for the visual experts out there in claustrum. And this is promoter dependent though. And we never see anything in uh, thalamus, uh, thalamocortical neurons being labeled. Similarly, we've done these experiments in the superior colliculus, and we see um, the emergence of a nice projectome map there too. Cortical tectal projections are really well labeled, regardless of promoter. Almost all the subcortical projections we've looked at are poorly or labeled or completely missing. For example, from the substantia nigra pars reticulata, which should have um, really nice labeling, but doesn't. So finally, we want to validate the functionality of all these methods. This is what we're moving toward next. Um, in my lab, we're going to use this frontal eye field to projection as a test bed. Um, and it, we're collaborating with Tony Mavshin and Michael Hawken at NYU, who are, are going to use these methods in other visual areas. So the idea here is to inject RAV2 retro in the colliculus, and including an opsin. We're using a reacher for this. So that should retrogradely label neurons in frontal eye field. We've already shown that it does. And then we will um, study those neurons using phototagging to identify them, which is uh, using a laser to illuminate them while recording the um, light evoked responses. Um, and we're using strict criteria for this based on synapse blocking NBQX experiments that we've already done in rats. So we'll validate this by comparing against a really large reference data set of known frontal eye field colliculus projecting neurons that I've accumulated using electrophysiological methods. We're also examining uh, retina to colliculus uh, projection neurons as a collaboration with uh, Greg Field here at Duke. So in conclusion, optogenetics is a mature field, but not in monkeys. A major bottleneck is the viral delivery and expression of the opsin genes. We need to increase the efficacy of the vectors overall, enhance, map, and validate them. Now the outcome here, if we can control the immune reactions, if we can map the projectomes and uh, validate the functionality, optogenetics may revolutionize brain research in monkeys as it has in other uh, smaller lab animals. And this is not only important for basic research, but critical for another primate brain, the human brain. And one of the long-term goals here is to improve human gene therapies um, for brain disorders. So I just wanna acknowledge my lab. Um, the main players I've already shown, Martin over here, Hala here, Tierney's not shown here, and Jesse, who does all of our lab animal work. This is supported by the NIH, Pfizer, NC Biotech, Hartwell Foundation, and Dibs here at Duke. Thanks.